So um, we are in the middle of our unit on land use controls, right? So we've been talking about a couple different mechanisms. We've been talking about a tort law mechanism for managing land use conflicts. That was our piece on nuisance law. We've been talking about contract law mechanisms for constraining land uses. So we started with easements, right? One of the types of servitudes, um, the one that is more property-like. And then we moved last class to covenants. So we talked a lot about the different tests for covenants, how you make a covenant, how you enforce a covenant, either as a real covenant, so seeking damages, or as an equitable servitude, uh, so seeking an injunction. And we talked about some of the meanings of those different pieces of the test, like the touch and concern piece, right, which is the most complicated piece. We talked about the spectrum for evaluating that. Uh, but today we're moving to the regulatory mechanism that is used to control conflicting land uses, and that is the law of zoning. Um, as I've mentioned to you, this unit is the subject of an entire upper level class taught here either by me or by Professor Cannon. Uh, so th to the extent you find any of this interesting, uh, there is a lot more where that comes from. Um, but I'll move to today's question. So it's why is America divided into zoning districts and what do they do? So we have two objectives. First, we'll identify the basics and question the wisdom of conservation easements. So one sort of regulatory form, it's kind of a hybrid of regulation and private uh, land use control. And we're also gonna talk about the history and general structure of zoning law. So I'm gonna take those in reverse order. So we'll start actually with an introduction to zoning, a bit on the history of zoning, um, and then we will move to conservation easements. So introduction to zoning, your book gave you a little bit of a picture of sort of where zoning comes from. Uh, this is a relatively modern uh, institution, at least relatively modern compared to some of the things from the 1200s that we're usually talking about in property. Uh, but modern land use regulation conventionally is thought of as originating in the late 19th century. It's really a function of technology, right? We're starting to get higher buildings. We're starting to get new types of land uses that are noxious with new technology. So early land use controls start to emerge in about the 1880s. So uh, in the 1880s, New York City grows interested in restricting building heights. I'll move this down a little. So actually they establish a committee delightfully titled the Height of Buildings Commission. Uh, my dream would be to be on such a thing. Um, <laughs> but they grow interested in restricting building heights. Um, and so they start sort of evaluating how to do this, specifically with respect to tenements, right? So the bottom left, lots of crowded places that are getting taller and taller. They're thinking about how to constrain that. Um, also, certain types of uses start to be restricted. So the text in the top left is an 1885 ordinance from Modesto, California. It's an ordinance banning wash houses or laundries. And ostensibly the reason for these controls is safety. So we're in the era of great fires, right? So uh, tenements in particular are worrisome. They're often shoddily built. There's a lot of people cramped into a space with a single stairwell. So we wanna restrict the height of these things to prevent sort of loss in great fires. Laundries too, wash houses, things like that, they actually involve boiling water on really hot stoves. And so laundry fires, fairly common, uh, often resulted in the destruction of adjoining buildings or entire neighborhoods. Um, so this is sort of what's giving rise to the need for land use control. Uh, interest in regulating both the height of buildings and the use of buildings leads to two early Supreme Court cases. Um, so the first comes from this scenario. There's a case called Welch versus Swayze. It's 1909. What had happened was this. Boston had restricted the heights of buildings throughout Boston to about 125 feet. Uh, but they'd restricted the buildings around Copley Square. This is the predecessor to Copley Square. Some of you might recognize the Boston Public Library there. Uh, they restricted the heights of buildings there to about 90 feet. Um, 
as you can see, there's a non-conforming use, as we might charitably call it, which is Old South Church Tower, 246 feet high. The sort of astonishing uh, incongruity there is also maybe what gives rise to the need to limit heights. We're seeing sort of big buildings starting to crop up, and Boston decides to take control of this. Um, so anyway, this makes its way, a, bu a building owner who is trying to build a taller building, a building taller than 90 feet, uh, sues, and this challenge makes its way to the Supreme Court in this case of Welch. And there, weirdly enough, he actually conceded that uh, limiting the heights of buildings was legitimate, but said, as applied to me, it's unreasonable, just in this particular instance. Classic strategy. Um, but the court totally deferred to the Massachusetts legislatures and courts judgment, and it actually noted fire issues, the availability of water in Boston as potentially being an issue, and so said this is a reasonable height restriction. As I mentioned, um, cities are also trying to do use restrictions at this time. So Los Angeles, for example, splits cities into districts, <laughs> limits one to residences, and it bans brickyards in some of these districts. And again, someone with a brickyard is upset about this and decides to take it all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, is asked again to weigh in on an ordinance as applied to that specific landowner. It's unreasonable to prevent my brickyard in particular. And the Supreme Court again upholds the city's ability to do that. And that is a case called Hadachek versus Sebastian. Which is from 1915. Where modern zoning is born, though, is really in New York City. Uh, and it's motivated by this monstrosity, like that my text is in the middle of the slide there, but uh, it's this, this is the equitable building. So um, this building is at 120 Broadway. It's built and completed in 1914. It was 48 stories tall, and it cast a seven acre shadow. So try to imagine yourself as a person in 1914, right? We're in the era of hoop skirts. They've just started taking cocaine out of Coca-Cola. Seven, <laughs> seven acre shadow is pretty terrifying. I've tried to give you a sense of kind of how imposing this might have looked, right? From sort of underneath it. So uh, this building terrifies everyone. And uh, they decide, the legislators in New York, decide to try to ban this sort of thing from happening again with law. What we get is the 1916 Zoning Resolution, which is really the first predecessor to the full-blown modern zoning ordinance. So this uh, ordinance does a few things. It splits the city into three districts, residential, business, and unrestricted or industrial. And this was in response to garment factories, which were actually starting to creep up Fifth Avenue. So they're trying to prevent those from encroaching on residential parts of New York. It also restricted heights. So once you built to a certain height that was set by the width of the street, you then had to set the floors of the building back a bit from the street. So you could build up, and then once you got to that height, you'd build in, up, and then you'd have to build in again. And so a lot of architects sort of made their money on maximizing building volumes in conjunction with this law. So if you ever wondered why New York has a lot of buildings that look like staircases, this is pretty much a function of the 1916 zoning law because it's requiring people to go back in a little bit once they've reached a certain height. So again, architects make a lot of money designing buildings that comply uh, with, this, with this set of rules. There was a lot of interest in this 1916 act. And that led uh, then Commerce Secretary Herbert Hoover uh, to actually create a subcommittee to draft laws that would permit states to enable localities to zone. So remember we've talked about before, local governments have to be enabled to do things by the state government. They have to have authority from the state. That's that Dillon's rule stuff and the home rule stuff that we've talked about in past classes. So uh, Hoover's committee drafts something called the Standard Zoning Enabling Act, or the SZEA. This is basically a piece of legislation that states can enact that will allow localities to do the sorts of rulemaking that New York City did. The SZEA does four important things. So first, it delegates the power to zone. 
So again, authorizes localities to zone. It also establishes procedures for things like amending your zoning code or uh, making exceptions from it or variances, basically declining to enforce it against particular owners. So a set of procedural rules come from the SZEA as well. It creates a little local administrative body called the Board of Zoning Appeals to actually administer this law and again decide whether to grant exceptions or not. And finally, it uh, requires localities to zone in accordance with a comprehensive plan. The history of this language is kind of interesting. I talk a lot about it in land use uh, because somehow it is read not to require a plan at all. Um, so localities don't even really have to have a plan. It can be sort of implied from general policy statements uh, or just sort of implicit in the text of the zoning code itself. Um, but some localities do have a comprehensive plan um, and actually here in Charlottesville, we are in the process of revising ours right now. Um, so I'll show you just a little bit of that, um, which I find kind of entertaining. Um, so there's often a lot of sort of uh, community engagement as they're thinking about the plan, which is essentially sort of an assessment of strengths, weaknesses that uh, the city has, ideas about how it should grow, what areas we need to constrain development or really encourage development and housing. Um, it often contains a lot of uh, exciting plan sort of policy statements, I'm trying to find some of them here. Um, so sort of like the values of the city will be considered. The places where we live are important. It's often pretty broad language. So when we say in accordance with a comprehensive plan, that might not be a very toothy requirement, uh, let's say. But as I mentioned in 2018, uh, this is happening here in Charlottesville, so you might see sort of flyers around town about community engagement meetings as they're thinking about uh, redrafting this. All right, so to get back into my slides, there we go. Um, of course, zoning doesn't stay sort of as quaint as height restrictions and use restrictions forever. Um, zoning takes off very quickly. So actually by 1930, just a few years after this Hoover Commission, already 35 states have passed the SZEA. Of course, now it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, but modern zoning is now a lot more complicated. Um, so again, not as quaint as sort of, you can only build two stories or whatever. Um, instead, we have lots of different, really fine-grained use definitions, lots of different types of uses. I think at last count, or at least when the book was published, uh, there are over 176 different uses in New York. Things like setbacks, how far you have to be from the street, Things like side yards, so how far you have to be from your lot line. Some ordinances say you can only take up a particular area on your lot, so lot coverage. And there's a lot of other things. So things like overlay zones or planned unit developments where actually they just sort of impose specific zoning rules uh, for one little area. This is all stuff, again, I talk about a lot more in land use, but uh, zoning is sort of obvious to us now, right? We've all sort of grown up with it. Um, we're quite used to it. But at the outset, its future was actually quite uncertain. Um, so I like to look at, because I'm strange, uh, old newspaper advertisements about zoning. Um, so this is a, a publication by the city of Seattle, like, did you want this next to your property? <gasps> Horror story, one story homes. Um, <laughs> but also uh, a lot of news coverage of sort of challenges to zoning, of which there were many. Um, so in its early years, lots of people are suing in the state courts, saying this is a, an unreasonable restriction on property. It's a violation of, con of the Constitution. Um, and a number of states upheld zoning as a valid use of the police power, something that localities and states could do. But a number also said this was unconstitutional. There was no valid purpose behind zoning. And so this is the split that leads to the court case you read, which is Euclid versus Ambler Realty. Probably one of the most important cases in land use law. So I'll talk a bit about this diagram in a second, but let's just run through the facts. So Euclid is a municipality in the Cleveland area. In 1922, the village council adopts an ordinance that establishes a comprehensive zoning plan, dividing the city into six use districts, U1 through U6, uh, three height districts, H1 through H3, and I think four area districts, so uh, A1 through A4. <laughs> They're really predictable in their naming of the district types in this, uh, in this municipality. This is a cumulative zoning. So what do I mean by that? 
Cumulative zoning means that in a zone of a given level, you can have uses of that level or any higher use. So specifically with those use districts, U1 only permits single family residences. U2 permits slightly more intensive uses, slightly more people, all the way down to U6, which permits industrial uses, heavy intensive uses. But in a U4, for example, you could do any of the things permitted in U's one through three. Um, so that's what we mean by cumulative. It actually encompasses everything that is less intensive. This is sometimes also called Euclidean zoning after this case. Ambler Realty owns 68 acres of undeveloped land at the west end of Euclid between the Nickel Plate Railroad and Euclid Avenue. Note from this map that U1 uses, so those residential uses, are all around the Ambler tract. So on sort of uh, definitely one side of it and right across the street on Euclid Avenue. And so under the zoning scheme, what would happen is that industrial uses essentially would only be permitted if this zoning law was put into effect in that U6 area. And so uh, this is devaluing their property because those areas that are now zoned U2 and U3, they can't have industry there. And so they're less valuable as a result. Note that probably what Euclid is trying to do is put in a buffer zone right between the residential neighborhood across the street and more intensive uses toward the railroad tracks. Ambler Realty claims that the diminution in value here was about 75% as a result of the imposition of this zoning ordinance. So they challenge the zoning law on both due process and equal protection grounds. They want an injunction against its enforcement. And this was a challenge to the zoning ordinance as a whole, not as applied. So they actually hadn't really applied for exceptions or anything like that yet. Instead, they were saying this ordinance as a whole has no legitimate purpose behind it. They wanted a broad ruling here, a very broad ruling that zoning was itself unconstitutional. Remember those earlier rulings, Welch and Hadachek, they had said that height restrictions were legitimate. They had said that uh, maybe banning offensive uses like brickyards is legitimate. But here, there were some other things banned, right? So apartment buildings not allowed in some areas. Industrial uses that are not in and of themselves offensive, not allowed in some areas. Um, so that's what this case is about, is really is zoning itself allowed or unconstitutional? And here in the opinion you read, which is by Justice Sutherland, uh, they uphold the zoning ordinance as both valid under the Equal Protection and the Due Process Clauses. And they apply a rational basis test. Under that version of the rational basis test, zoning ordinance must only be, uh, zoning ordinances rather, must only be rationally related to a legitimate state interest. And so here, promotion of safety and security, maybe some other things. Note that they rely on an extensive analogy here to nuisance law, right? That makes this seem less radical. Oh, this is a nuisance. We're used to doing this. Localities are used to regulating this. So they're kind of analogizing the nuisance law as a way of making zoning look less radical than it actually is. Court essentially ends up holding that zoning ordinances are constitutional as long as they're not arbitrary or unreasonable, which is another way of saying that they're substantially related to public health, safety, morals, or general welfare, some legitimate police power purpose. So health, safety, welfare, the traditional police power justifications. And this is still the general test. This is still the general rational basis test for talking about zoning ordinances. Is the ordinance rationally related to a state interest, safety, health, welfare. We're gonna get more into sort of the reasons behind the holding in a second and how the court kind of comes to the uh, justification it does. Uh, but first I wanna give you three little side notes on Euclid. So with one exception, what's really interesting for people who study land use is that the Supreme Court has not heard a case about sort of the legitimacy of zoning since. They hear takings cases often, 
but about the legitimacy of zoning as an equal protection or due process matter writ large. Instead, the state Supreme Courts have really exercised control in this area. So the Supreme Court sort of makes this landmark Euclid decision, they weigh in one more time, and then they back away from it for now almost 100 years. So state courts are really where the, the, most of the law on this is made. Second interesting side note, um, an article by Professor Dan Tarlock uh, reports that actually after the oral argument in this case, the justices voted 5-4 the other way, so to strike down zoning as unconstitutional. And what's amazing, uh, sort of a procedural matter, is that one of the authors of the New York City zoning law in 1916 was named Alfred Bettman, and he was actually friends with Chief Justice Taft from back in the day. And so he urged Taft to allow the case to be re-argued and to allow him to submit an amicus brief uh, on behalf of zoning. And he did, in which he heavily drew on nuisance principles. And so that amicus brief is viewed as having changed the whole history of land use, really. Without zoning, we don't have a land use class. Um, and so when they re-argue the case, that changes the outcome. We come out the other way. Uh, so it's always amazing sort of how close we came to not having this thing that we all assume is sort of foundational. Third, the, the history of the Ambler site. Um, so uh, comically enough, this whole site ended up being condemned by the federal government. <laughs> Um, and so they end up using it during World War II to build uh, a factory that made aircraft engines and landing gear. Subsequently, it became sort of a division of GM. Um, and now, uh, a comment on Canvas noted this, they have a lovely plaque on site uh, as of 2016 commemorating the Euclid versus Ambler Realty decision. I have not gotten there yet. I will. I love property field trips. We'll rent a bus. We'll all go together. <laughs> Um, but just interesting post history that actually Ambler really never built it any, uh, ended up building anything on the site at all. Um, all right, so I'd like to do a little exercise here uh, to sort of think about the court's reasoning. Uh, so here's what I'd like you to do. So on your notes sheet, there is a paragraph, passage one, it's also part of the case. Uh, please only read that passage for now. Uh, and what I'd like you to do is kind of circle three to five words or phrases that strike you as important reasons that the court is upholding zoning. So reasons from that paragraph that seem to be motivating the court in finding that there are interests here. And again, these can be legitimate or not. So you don't have to agree with what the court's saying or think it's a good thing, uh, just sort of what is motivating the court. So three to five things. Um, and then I'm gonna have you weigh in uh, with one of our polls. So. Um, here's my handy poll everywhere. So uh, if you could just do that, let's say three minutes to read and kind of mark it up and then another couple minutes I'll watch the results come in um, and then we will uh, see what you generate as the reasons why the court uh, is reaching its conclusion here. Excellent. All right. So this is a word cloud of what's going on in Euclid, right? So uh, it's always interesting to see, I, you know, I do this in a bunch of different classes, sort of which uh, things become bigger as we go on. So um, let's talk about some of the reasoning here. So I'll bring up this board quietly. <laughs> so uh, reasons for upholding zoning. All right, so I'm seeing safety is the biggest one. So someone who puts safety, what is the court talking about there? Maggie. Oh, they were talking about by having, you know, you're providing like when there's a fire, like no kind of response to having provide fire safety. Right, so fire safety maybe in particular. And so this kind of makes sense, right, that uh, if a lot of the motivation for uh, zoning rather uh, originally was about fire, it makes sense that uh, they would sort of continue it, right, that this would be an important uh, motivating factor. The court had talked about fire in both Welch and had a check. Uh, so maybe felt like they were on strong ground there. So we've got fire as kind of a smaller thing there, but safety definitely being really important. How about children? What is going on with zoning and children here? Rachel. You mentioned like decreasing street traffic, which is like where children play. Obviously. Right, so children need to play. And if we don't sort of protect them with zoning, there will just be sort of cars running around, running them over. Um, so we're trying to do this for the children, zoning for the children to protect them in their play. Um, let's see, so security sort of related to safety. I think. 
I don't know why this, the word cloud keeps shifting, but, uh, but uh, how about environment? What's going on with environment? So what are they trying to protect when they're talking about the environment? Jeff? Well, they mentioned environment in the sense of rearing children and also in the residential character of the neighborhood. It just seems like a lot of language is very much designed to protect the entrenched interests of the culture that currently exists. Yeah. Whatever future culture uh, could emerge is just completely disregarded. Right. So we're trying to preserve the residential character. The environment is about preserving the existing surrounding space. Um, so that's what they're talking about when they're talking about environment, preserving the residences, preserving the character of the community. What else? Anything else up there that struck any of you? Ethan? Noise. Noise, right. So what were they talking about with noise? Yeah. So traffic, industry, apartments. This connects to Jeff's point, I think, which is that if we change the character of the neighborhood, we're suddenly going to start to have, you know, industry, traffic, loud noise in this beautiful, blissful residential environment. Anything else? Christian. More so to the standard of review, rational basis, but I noticed that they mentioned that the results have been set forth in a very like comprehensive and painstaking reports. Yeah. Painstaking deliberation. As I always say, I think the words institutional capacity are going to be on my grave because this is an institutional capacity point, right? Like they've deliberated, they've drafted this uh, ordinance, they've deliberated over it, they've considered it. And so we should not sort of disturb that painstaking deliberation. I'm going to abbreviate it IC, institutional capacity point. What else? Arena. Um, I think in another attempt to make this zoning process not seem so extreme, they've harkened back to other things we've seen, like the fact that apartment buildings interfere with circulation of air and not the rays of the sun. Right. <laughs> air, sun. Ah, this looks familiar, right? Two things for which we've historically allowed contractual land use restrictions, right? Easements of light, easements of air. Like you said, exactly, trying to make this look sort of less radical. They're just trying to preserve things that we've already let people do for a very long time. What else? How about parasite? I see that fairly large up there. Um, so what are they talking about when they're talking about parasite? Jesse. I, th I think they're talking about class. Yeah. If presumably they're OK with having a zone in a bunch of apartment complexes, as long as it's not with all the, the one star or single family homes. Right. So parasite, this idea, I think you're right, that people are sort of um, taking in, uh, mm -hmm. or rather, uh, enjoying things that they're not paying for, right? Parasites benefit from other people's uh, activities, other people's work, and sort of the biological uh, definition. They're sort of hangers on, right? Um, and so parasite here, I think exactly, they're talking about, um, about the uh, sort of lower classes enjoying amenities for which they have not paid. Um, some other things I think that are important here. How about women and their nervous disorders? <laughs> I can't believe no one mentioned that one. Uh, women and their nervous disorders. Uh, this is a particular view, right? Especially in conjunction with children, right? We're sort of hearkening to the vulnerable people, like the women and children get in the lifeboats first. Uh, the women and children will be saved by the zoning, right? We'll prevent them from having panic attacks in response to things like traffic. Uh, <laughs> just, just, I'm still having panic attacks, but that's me. Um, and so I think that's uh, another thing that is kind of important. Uh, the apartment as well, right? is definitely the problem here. Um, the apartment industry too, uh, but they note uh, sort of how an apartment uh, is, is restricting the growth of residential communities. Um, they notice uh, as well, uh, this is elsewhere in the opinion, but they say a pig belongs in a barnyard, not a parlor. And they're talking about apartments, and they're talking about what the pig is. And so this idea that apartments are inherently negative, that also has class connotations, right? <laughs> 
Um, okay, so I think that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. Protection of property values too. So um, protection of property values uh, being sort of a, a legitimate goal, although that also must entail exclusion, right? So um, if we're going to inc include sort of higher property values is something that's definitely going to uh, restrict uh, people being able to enter. So I think that is a part of what's going on here as well. All right. Since you're so well behaved with the word cloud, <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, remember here, so we haven't talked about this yet, but uh, we've mentioned class. But another element of what's going on, although it's not sort of as explicit in this opinion, uh, is race. So class is maybe a bit more obvious from that paragraph, but another element of what's going on is race. So let's think back to that 1885 ordinance uh, that I opened with, right? So Modesto, California banning laundries. Some of you may have had a thought when I said Modesto, California is banning laundries. Because who is operating laundries in California? Chinese immigrants, right? This is a way, uh, it literally is pretty astonishing in this, it literally constrains Chinese laundries to across the tracks, right? This is forcing them to go across a set of railroad tracks. So the earliest zoning ordinance is already about race. <laughs> zoning gets even more explicitly racial in its early history. The first attempt at it just sort of nakedly discriminatory zoning ordinance is 1910. It comes out of Baltimore. This is a newspaper article about it up on the slide. Uh, the ordinance, I'll show you the text in one second, uh, essentially established separate neighborhoods for whites uh, and blacks. And the way it did that was by preventing whites from moving to majority black blocks and preventing uh, blacks from moving to majority white blocks. And so similar ordinances end up being passed by 11 states, mostly Southern, including Virginia. The Baltimore ordinance in particular has an interesting history because it was motivated by a single person, which is George McMechan, who was on the right hand uh, part of the slide. Uh, he's a lawyer in Baltimore. He actually graduated from Yale Law School in the 1890s. Um, and the McMechan family moves into a uh, upper scale white neighborhood, upper class rather, and they're subject to constant threats, violence, harassment, vandalism, from intolerant neighbors uh, who are angry because they're not, uh, they're having to share the block. And the McMechan family refuses to cower or leave their residences. And so this ordinance ends up uh, passed. So as you can see from the news article, it mentions uh, here that uh, McMechan's occupancy of the house causes the segregation ordinance pretty directly. So they respond to this conflict by passing this discriminatory ordinance. And McMechan, in his own words, um, again, he's a lawyer, so he gets interviewed uh, by the New York Times and says, my opinion as a lawyer is that this sort of zoning is clearly un unconstitutional, although on its face it appears equally fair to white and black, but there never has been and there never will be any houses erected in Baltimore exclusively for black occupancy. So in other words, nobody is building majority black blocks. Nobody is building majority black blocks. And uh, he says, essentially, we who desire comfortable quarters have the ability to pay for them. We have to seek houses abandoned by whites. That's all we have. Um, and these are sort of prescient words in light of the subsequent history of residential segregation. Uh, McMechan is pretty inspirational, but there's something else pretty amazing uh, and surprising. And you had a little bit of reading on this, but uh, these types of ordinances get killed very quickly. Um, so uh, again, the book notes this briefly. It's a testament to creative lawyering. So remember I said that zoning really takes off circa 1916. It's actually in 1917 that racial zoning gets struck down by the Supreme Court in a case called Buchanan versus Worley. This case invalidated Louisville, Kentucky's ordinance. Uh, it was exactly like Baltimore's, so prohibited essentially the tipping of blocks. Creative lawyering was this, again, the book notes this quickly, but I wanna make sure you hear it. So uh, this was a due process claim based on the deprivation of the white owner's right to sell his property. It was sort of a setup. So in 1915, 
Worley is a prospective black buyer. Uh, he makes an offer to Buchanan for his property in a predominantly white neighborhood. Buchanan appears to have been sympathetic to civil rights causes, and so he accepts the offer, but Worley says he can't complete the transaction because it would force him to violate the law. So Buchanan sues Worley to force uh, Worley to complete the purchase, but really they were kind of on the same side. And uh, Buchanan notes that the racial ordinance is depriving him of his right to sell or lease the property, so violates the due process clause. Indeed, according to one scholar, uh, actually Justice Holmes would have thrown the case out because he viewed it as manufactured, not really a real case about the issue, uh, but he ended up shredding a draft that would have found as much uh, and sides with the majority, says that racial zoning is unconstitutional, violates the due process clause. After this decision in Buchanan, zoning ordinances for the most part no longer explicitly require segregation. So they're not drafted explicitly like this. But there are other ways that segregation is maintained. So we've encountered one of them already, right? So private racially restrictive covenants, Shelley versus Kramer. Until Shelley versus Kramer, between 1917 and 1948, uh, those are really effective and they even persist as we noted after that, although they're not enforceable um, as a signaling mechanism. And in addition to private covenants, uh, modern land use controls sort of indirectly perpetuate segregation. This becomes very effective as race and class dynamics overlap. So if you require giant lots with particular types of housing on them, you can functionally price lower income individuals out of a neighborhood. Um, and so this, as again, race and class dynamics overlap, perpetuates uh, segregated patterns. One thing that's interesting is that this purpose, I don't think was distant from the lower court's mind in Euclid. So this is a long wall of text, but the important part is in bold. So this is the, the lower court opinion in, Luke, in Euclid, where the court says the result to be accomplished by zoning is to classify the population and segregate them according to their income and situation in life. So they view zoning as segregation, just a way of perpetuating segregation and it, as being problematic for that reason. And so I think, again, what's interesting, we've put up all these reasons why zoning is legitimate, but the lower court sort of recognized them as well and just thought that the nefarious ones outweighed the uh, potentially positive ones. I call this mixed motives in zoning. So zoning is having had mixed motives basically since its outset. So there's lots of things, again, on the list that you generated that I think is, you know, sort of valid zoning purposes, right? Fire safety. Probably want localities to regulate to prevent uh, the dr drastic costs of fires. We might be worried about traffic. We might actually be worried about traffic accidents, even though maybe the language about children at play being sort of mown down by Model Ts is a little bit overblown. But uh, the stuff about class, more negative. Right, so I think uh, the mix of motives is there, even in that paragraph in Euclid, which is why I like to have you do that uh, exercise. As I said, this mix of motives still present in zoning and definitely present across its history. Um, I like this, uh, again, these sorts of newspaper ads about zoning. This one comes from Houston in uh, the 1940s. You can't really read it, but uh, here are some of the things it says in the middle there where it's addressing sort of why you should vote for zoning if you are any of these types of people says, Mrs. Housewife, keep honky-tonks away from your home, your church, and the school your children attend. Uh, honky-tonks are bars, although I liked to imagine they were like musicians that were out of control, but no, they're in fact bars, so keep bars away from your kids. Um, mothers, protect your children against blighted slum areas uh, that destroy both character and health. So again, even in that sentence, character, growing up near low-income people, will cause you to lose some character, but then also the legitimate purpose, health, right? Uh, Mr. Homeowner, your home is your most important investment. Protect its value, which again has an implicitly exclusionary uh, purpose. Again, mix of motives present not just through the 40s, but also today, uh, and the reasons why particular uh, land uses are undesirable. So you may have heard this term before, NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. 
it's a term for people who, uh, you know, espouse sort of egalitarian values, but then are like, oh, I want more housing, just not next door to me, not in my backyard. Um, and so it can be difficult to distinguish legitimate concerns. So I'm worried about traffic. I'm worried about sort of the capacity of the streets to handle more people from prejudices, which is that I'm worried the apartment building is going to change the character of my neighborhood in some way that I don't like. We're going to talk um, a lot more about zoning policy and exclusionary zoning uh, next class, but just a brief note on Euclid before we move on. So uh, the test from Euclid is a new test for constitutionality. So does a zoning ordinance substantially advance a legitimate public purpose? So does it advance health, safety, general welfare purposes? Seems like being able to claim things like safety, you're in good, a good spot. One that raises uh, difficult questions is actually aesthetics. So whether zoning for appearance is legitimate. Um, seems like usually yes, although it's much stronger if you can claim both an aesthetic purpose, like we want to preserve a community's appearance, and a more traditional police power justification like safety. Um, so that's one that often raises questions. Questions on Euclid or zoning generally. Carter. Could the aesthetic consideration be tied to like economic value? Yeah, so you can try to tie it to economic value, exactly. Although you're, again, safer when you're talking about you're the, the best police power purpose from a court's perspective is health and safety, no question. So even sort of, yeah, more sort of property value protection is you're on shakier ground, I think. Health and safety, if you can tie it to traffic, fire risk, anything like that, that looks like real traditional police power concern. Anything else? All right, exceptional. Um, so now I want to talk about conservation easements for a second. Helpful sign here, uh, indicating the existence of a conservation easement. Uh, and I just want to walk through some basics. We'll probably end up talking a bit more about this next class. Um, so conservation easements are kind of odd. They're a little bit of a hybrid between the sort of contractual land use restrictions we've seen and sort of full-blown regulatory instruments because they couldn't emerge from the common law. The common law wouldn't recognize these kinds of things um, because they were sort of engrossed, right? They're assigned to a particular person as opposed to being attached uh, to land, at least of the beneficiary. And so there are agreements, uh, they're legally binding agreements between a property owner and typically either a nonprofit organization like a land trust or a government agency. And these are agreements that restrict development on land covered by the easement. The property owner who donates the easement, predictably called the grantor, they retain ownership of the property, but they relinquish their rights to develop it any further or in ways that are inconsistent with the easement as drafted. The organization that receives or buys the easement is called the grantee. Again, pretty predictable. They just hold on to that interest in the property and they're usually the ones who are enforcing it, so monitoring the property to make sure that uh, the landowner remains in compliance. Primarily for tax reasons, these easements are donated in perpetuity. So they are forever. Can't be time limited, and that's again for tax reasons. As I mentioned, they're a bit hybrid. So there is like an underlying contract that applies, but these programs have to be enabled by state law. So there's state law that will set out things like who can hold an easement, what sorts of organizations are qualified, local governments, nonprofits, et cetera. There is now enabling legislation in all 50 states for these. Particularly since the 80s, the number of land trusts uh, and also the acres of land held under easements has really just exploded. So land trusts uh, control about 37 million acres of land throughout the U.S. Large land trusts like the Nature Conservancy account for most of this. And uh, state and local governments also hold a lot of these easements. So I think about 6.2 million acres at last count. So a lot of land is held under conservation easements. 
they're prolifer proliferating rather fast. So even since 2000, uh, the amount has tripled, at least with respect to the amount of holdings by local governments. So they're growing quickly. So why we put land under easements? I'll talk about this from the grantor's perspective and then from the grantee's perspective. So pretty clearly, tax incentives, right? So this can be sometimes income tax incentives, uh, sometimes estate tax so associated with inheritance. Sometimes you get estate tax benefits, sometimes property tax benefits. So tax benefits, the main reason the grantor will give these uh, easements. And from the grantee's perspective, uh, there are a variety of reasons why grantees want easements. So this is better than nothing, right? This is a way of preserving the land on a sort of volunteer basis um, in the absence of regulation. And as a result of that, it might p be sort of more politically expedient. So imagine you have the option to either engage in an easement program or to just prevent people from building. Probably going to be more politically palatable to create a voluntary easement program than to just tell people they can't build. talk about kind of pros and cons of these things as well. So uh, easements are pretty cost effective, right? The grantor typically gets a, uh, a tax benefit, but sometimes it doesn't require an outright purchase. So if you have limited conservation dollars, sort of a, an easement is a way to extend those dollars by sort of reserving your funds for purchasing, uh, outright purchasing land, and you just sort of accept easements as a way of doing, uh, doing this sorts of preservation. These also uh, are particularly useful for preserving farming and ranching uses. So can preserve land use that's kind of under threat at the border of development. And one of the reasons it's appealing in a lot of places, again, politically, is that small family farmers and ranchers can take advantage of easements to kind of protect those entities against uh, encroaching development. It can also be used to control sprawl. Right, so this is the idea that, uh, especially in the West, cities have just expanded at a pretty unsustainable rate out from their centers. You can use e easements to sort of constrain, to create a boundary uh, between the city and the surrounding countryside. Cons of easements. We'll talk about some of those. So uh, the terms of easements, again, these are agreements, so each e agreement will vary, but the terms of easements can seem kind of arbitrary or difficult to enforce. I teach a case in land use uh, about uh, a, an easement that would not permit a swimming pool, but would it allow them to sort of create a man-made lake in the middle of their property. And so the terms of that easement, and whether that was kind of a reasonable way to draw the lines, very kind of unclear, can seem kind of arbitrary. Their perpetual nature is probably the biggest uh, con to the easement. So we've talked a lot in property about how uh, we generally favor, uh, disfavor rather dead hand control, right? People sort of permanently restricting their property. And this absolutely permanently restricts property. They're in perpetuity. In fact, they are quite challenging to terminate. So state law may restrict who can have them or their transfer. And also judges often can only change them if sort of uh, impossibility is a factor. So it's really difficult to even amend an easement unless sort of there's an impossibility associated with it <coughs> or a local government has to condemn it and actually pay for it. So they're very difficult to terminate, to change, to transfer. Again, sort of dead hand control writ large. I'll talk about this more in a second, but enforcement of these can sometimes also seem draconian. So the grantee is the person who has to make sure that a landowner is actually not developing or is complying with the terms of the easement. And this can be kind of invasive for a landowner, um, depending on how aggressive the uh, group is at uh, kind of enforcing them. We'll talk about a real example of that in a second. Uh, we are surrounded in a place here in central Virginia where there are a lot of conservation 
easements. Uh, so Albemarle County has an easement program that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, there are also controversies associated with them. So one I'll mention close to here and then one a bit farther away. And then I'm trying to think, but I think we might have time to show a little clip uh, associated with the second uh, controversy. So uh, first, uh, the Trump winery area, Trump golf course, uh, is, is a proposed uh, use here near the Trump winery that would violate the terms of the conservation easement. Um, and so, uh, again, you have people trying to work around this easement to amend it. It's very difficult. And here, I believe the Virginia Outdoors Foundation is the group that actually holds the easement and doesn't view a golf course as sort of consistent with that original easement. Um, so uh, there's often controversies about golf courses, about uh, these wide open spaces, wineries, farm uses, and sort of what's permitted, how many people can come onto the property. Um, so this is one that I think is ongoing. Um, this is what I may show you a clip of. Uh, it's uh, the Martha Bonita situation. So this happened in Northern Virginia. But uh, here's kind of the facts that gave uh, rise to it. Um, I think actually it's Bonetta. I always want to say Bonita, but Martha Bonetta. Um, so she owned a farm up uh, near DC, closer to DC in the village of Paris, Virginia. Um, and it was part of a farm surrounding kind of historic house, a lot of open space. Um, and so the land was sold by actually her predecessor, an easement on the land was sold um, with a pretty protective uh, terms. So it allowed very few changes to the exterior appearance of the farm. Uh, it allowed one apartment in a barn complex, but no more. Uh, it allowed also strict limits, or rather put strict limits on the number of people who could visit the property each day. So that is maybe sort of a more unconventional easement term than you might think of, but um, as a result, the property was sold to well below market price. Um, so we've talked before about how sometimes it seems that um, that some of these restrictions are capitalized into property value. Um, so the idea was while Martha paid less for the property as a result of restrictions on the number of people um, that she could have visit, um, as well as all these other things about exterior appearance um, and the sorts of uses she could have. Um, but uh, what ended up happening was that Martha got fined about $5,000 a day after uh, someone saw a picture on Facebook of a birthday party, a child's birthday party, where they were violating the terms of the number of people that could be uh, on the property. And so there was a birthday celebration on her farm, uh, and as I mentioned, maybe draconian enforcement. So uh, I will now show you, I guess, a couple minutes of this, um, because we have a little time. So um, we'll watch just the first 12 minutes. So this goes on for a while. Uh, again, it, it documents also this birthday party, uh, which again, the, uh, the PUC was notified about through Facebook um, as a violation of the terms. But also, as you can see, they're very worried about residential use. Um, of course, PEC, as I mentioned, this has a perspective, right? Uh, sort of the people they found have a particular perspective and view on the situation. PEC, for their part, has their own uh, view, which is that they had some reason to believe there might have been residential uses. Um, they also mentioned, again, that what I said earlier, that this was capitalized into the purchase price. Right? So she paid a lower price for the property as a result of all these restrictions. And so even though it does seem draconian, you could have been aware, based on the fact the document was publicly filed, um, available before your purchase of the property. Um, What's interesting about the Bonetta situation, uh, again, raises uh, an institutional capacity argument. Because uh, after this film, after uh, Martha got a bunch of publicity uh, from it and from uh, sort of this dispute with Piedmont, uh, the Bonetta bill was actually put forward. So uh, this is a piece of legislation that prevents local regulation of some our agricultural operations, and specifically uh, farm sales, agritourism activities as well. And so when we think about sort of how, uh, how to control land uses, even though this seems like a private sort of partially private uh, way that people agree on land use, conservation easements as a whole. Turns out that even there, we're seeing a lot of legislation that is meant to sort of constrain the application of them and their terms when it comes to particular uses like farming. Um, as I mentioned, these sorts of easements are really proliferating. Um, and so I think this is an issue for your lifetime as attorneys. Um, so 
we might think again that their perpetual nature is a good thing, um, that you know, preserving open space is important, that controlling urban growth, preventing sprawl is important, but they are really difficult to terminate. And as more and more of them get put into place, um, I think that we're gonna start to see development come into head-to-head -head conflict with them. Again, they can be terminated through condemnation, um, but, uh, or sort of change circumstances and possibility, but uh, it is pretty difficult to, to modify them. Um, do we have any questions on conservation easements? We'll talk a bit more about them on next Monday, but Christian. Do you have to show that there is kind of a minimum threshold and risk that your land actually will be developed before you can get one, or can you just get one when you can Yeah, so I think that's kind of built into the idea that this is a bargain, which is that, um, that groups like land trusts will only seek to get easements that are actually beneficial or that do pose some sort of development risk. So there's no sort of affirmative requirement, um, but it's kind of built into the bargain. Ryan? Oh, sorry, Christian, you have a follow-up. Uh, yeah. Is, is that reflected in the, the amount of tax break you get as well, like the risk that you could be developed? Is that a higher Yeah, risk? so another problem that these pose that I didn't mention is valuation. So valuation, uh, sort of like how we should view the extent of the tax break. Um, and that's really difficult to calculate, right? And it can be really difficult to, t to calculate, particularly for luxury uses like golf courses, where it's sort of like, well, obviously this is valuable. Maybe it could be developed, but it probably wouldn't be because probably it's there because a lot of folks want it. Um, and so should you be able to get these huge million dollar tax deductions for putting an easement on your golf course? Again, we hope that built into the process you know, that the folks like the Nature Conservancy are only going to take easements on golf courses if there really is some sort of development risk. But the valuation issue is a huge one. Ryan, do you still have a question or was that similar? I was going to ask about golf courses. Yeah, right. So not, no explicit restriction, but we hope the bargain takes care of it. Jesse. He got the tax break, and we think that she's benefited by paying a lower price. Exactly. So he got the, the sort of lost value of the property in kind. Other questions? Irina. Um, you mentioned that the enabling legislation has restrictions on who can be the grantee. Yeah. If, are they of a sort where you're, there's any guarantee of the motives behind it? I just feel like it's, it would be so easy to establish a and really doesn't want or something. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, it usually is phrased as like qualified local government organization or qualified land trust. Um, and whether there's restrictions on sort of what counts as a land trust is an interesting point. I mean, I think things that count as land trust often fail to enforce. So I had a student a few years ago who wrote a paper um, about whether sort of Connecticut uh, land trusts were actually monitoring what was going on with their easements um, and found some disturbing things like, oh, there wasn't supposed to be a building and now there's a five-story apartment building there. So something must have happened along the way. And at that point, you know, if you ask a court to enforce it, they might say something like, well, it's impossible to enforce because they've invested this much money in it. It's kind of the ship has sailed. Um, so I don't think we've yet seen that sort of thing where land trusts are formed for like nefarious purposes, but we definitely see land trust on the spectrum from very trustworthy and good at enforcing to very sort of lax about enforcement, which is another reason that sort of their efficacy and preservation is questionable. Another thing I should mention is that um, one of the other problems, your book notes this, uh, that has come up with conservation easements is that they're patchwork. Right. So again, as we're thinking about them as an alternative to regulation, um, these are sort of going to lead to a patchwork of protection that may not sort of comprehensively protect, for example, the land along a river or something like that. So um, their patchwork nature is another part of this um, part of this calculation about whether they're on the whole good or not. Ava. Their conservation efforts, mm -hmm. so the public doesn't get any rights to be on that land. Right. So it, I, this is definitely a huge sort of the democratic perception is a huge, uh, another big uh, critique of these sorts of things. So, again, um, particularly when it's a land trust. So, when it's a local government, we might think that at least indirectly we elect our local government officials. We hope that they're representing us in the uh, easements that they're receiving. But when it's a nature conservancy, we haven't had any say over whether they're going to take an easement from the golf course. Um, so, this is the main, I would say, sort of more left 
critique of conservation easements is that, um, in fact, they don't enable sort of democratic participation about what gets preserved. Um, and they're sort of not transparent about who gets negotiated with or what the terms are, um, and that they're problematic for this reason. Any other questions? Carter. Oh, interesting. So I don't know that they go into that fine grained of detail, but even in like the Bonetta easement, you saw that there was, it was like no apartments. So they can kind of start to get at some real use based restrictions rather than kind of broad, um, you know, no development. They can talk about the number of people on property. They can talk about, you know, what sorts of uses are permitted, how many uh, residents you can have, how many structures. I don't know that I've seen resource specific ones like the one that you mentioned about sort of the amount of deforestation you could do, but one could imagine it. I mean, in that sense, they are kind of private agreements. So it would depend on the terms of the enabling statute and whether that would kind of be within the scope of what you know could be negotiated over. Any other questions? Great. All right. So a few takeaways today. First, conservation easements. These, as I mentioned, are a problem for your lifetime as attorneys. There are a lot of them. We might think about whether they're good or bad on balance. You might like them because they're voluntary, right? They accomplish good aims. They enable preservation. Um, but they're really difficult to terminate. They may not be democratically participatory. There may be valuation issues. And so just kind of thinking about these uh, will, I think, serve you well. Um, second, we talked about Euclid at the beginning. So Euclid is the case, very important. It upholds the constitutionality of zoning and sets the stage for modern urban development. Zoning ordinances are permissible if they substantially advance a legitimate public purpose, i.e. health, safety, morals is in there, general welfare. Morals, it's sort of the most questionable one. We've sort of moved toward aesthetics from morals. So health, safety, and general welfare being the big three. As I mentioned as well, Euclid sets the stage for a lot of the key conflicts in land use and property law. So there's a lot of mixed motives in that decision and in land use and property regulation generally. We also talked about nuisance law being a role or having a role here, right, in making zoning seem less radical than it might have been. And this history of zoning foreshadows its later problems. So that's what we'll turn to on Monday. We'll talk about uh, zoning policy again, and we'll also talk about exclusionary zoning and some more modern rulings that have tried to uh, remedy some of the exclusionary uh, potential, some of the exclusionary potential of zoning itself. That is it for today. I'll see you next week.